let me let me also try to if i may to open the panel to um to present the panelists and i think we have just had a fantastic panel but i have to repeat uh the history because this is also a great panel that we will have you will see um we'll be talking about innovation autonomy and pseudo managerial legitimations and we're going to speak about EU academia. And what I can see is that autonomy is the main subject and the concept of this uh, Marco Biaci conference. And it is also something precisely that we do like in academia because academic freedom seems to be and must be part of our jobs. So it still seems to be that we have to start appreciating how this freedom and autonomy go together and what we have to think about that in terms of subordination and what kind of protection is still needed in academic systems and academic careers. And so we have a great panel. Um, I think we're going to start immediately with the two power women from Poland, uh, Isabella Frotzak and uh, Marta, Marta Otto, who are both from the University of Lodz. And um, they, of course, are very well known for the organization of the LLRN conference, which will also be online this year, but which will be physically when time is over of COVID, let's hope so, in two years' time, also there in Poland. So thank you for this. But they are also known about uh, their work on precarious work. And I'm uh, very sort of curious on how this precarity will come back in the present, I'm sure it will. We have, of course, also another very robust panelist, which is David Mangan. And David, as we all know, is from Maynooth University, but still has a good link with Osgoode Hall Law School in Toronto and Canada. And he is not only a member of the editorial board of European Labour Law Journal, but he's also working on the intersection between IT and employment law. And this is exactly uh, what kind of thing he will be sharing with us. And of course, uh, last but not least, Nathalie, um, a sort of reaction will be given by Nathalie Wiedebach Munko from Aarhus University in Denmark, and she will feed the discussion for us. We will have time for a Q&A at the end. We're going to stick to our timing as much as possible. So it means speakers have 10 minutes to talk and then we open the floor uh, for others. And I think we're going to start with using the chat box. And if you have questions, drop it on the chat box. And I will try to arrange that the questions are being taken up and addressed to the correct panelists. I propose, uh, Isabella, that we start with you, like it is provided in the program. So thank you very much already. You have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Frank, for introducing uh, our panel. And uh, Professor Weiss, if you are willing to travel somewhere, I will be ready to travel with you from the 17th of May, because then I will get my second dose of vaccination. So feel free to invite me wherever you want to travel. I will be more than happy to, to do it with you. Uh, and thank you uh, also, Frank, for um, talking about LLRN, of course, we are waiting for you in Poland and we will wait for you as much as needed. Um, so when it comes to our panel, um, we have to be honest with you that it is just a starting point of our broader research. And uh, we will be uh, very happy if there are people uh, around the academia uh, who would like to join our project, you are more than welcome, so please just write to us if you find this topic interesting. And this topic is, in our opinion, super interesting because it covers all the deals which are uh, connected with our situation. Um, I didn't prepare a presentation uh, because uh, I didn't want to take up the risk that something will just not work. Uh, so you will uh, have to just uh, stick to me during my whole presentation. The subject uh, of my presentation is the concept of 
subordination in the academia. So my first question, uh, which rises in, in my head while I was uh, preparing and making research, was uh, was the Copernicus afraid of his discoveries? And of course, nowadays we know um, what uh, what happened uh, when he discovered what he discovered. Uh, but was he afraid at the time while he was doing, um, while he was conducting his research? Um, I will I will focus more on the subordination while the concept of freedom will be uh, discussed later on uh, by Marta. But I will just point some issues connected with the idea of freedom at the academia. So uh, my first concern is um, who do we classify as a good researcher? Uh, it uh, can be pointed out that uh, much of the progress in science uh, seems to be made uh, possible by those uh, who are independent um, and those who, uh, who are not in a mainstream, who slightly have a different way of thinking, who see the world in a different manner. Uh, what distinguishes then a scientist from someone who merely just reproduces uh, the, the standards which are already well known um, is not only open-mindedness, but also the courage to express one's views. So, of course, to have this courage, we have to feel that we are independent. We have to feel uh, that uh, there will be no consequences for us when we say what we really think. Um, and um, I would like to, uh, to limit my presentation only to the scientists who uh, work in the academia. Of course, there is a whole group of scientists who do work outside the uh, academia, uh, but the, um, in my opinion, the independent um, concept of those who are working at the academia looks a little bit different from the concept of, um, of subordination and freedom of those people who work outside the academia. We are focusing on the academia. So um, the, the second question, the second concern is um, how far can an employee in, in academia be independent in their actions nowadays? So basically, what can we do, we as people who are attending the conference, not to feel that we can bear some consequence? And what is also important to point out is that the most academics work on the basis of employment law contract, which is of course connected with so-called subordination paradigm. Um, and the question is, is this paradigm in the academia different than the general one. The other uh, very important point uh, of my analysis is the uh, financial and organizational uh, point of view from the perspective of resources which are being allocated for the research. So the growing expectation uh, towards scientists, Ma Marta will tell you more about it later on, not always coincide with the increase of financial outlay uh, on the development of research. Mm, and especially in the countries in which the general uh, financial, financial resources for research are relatively low and the, the situation will probably get worse after COVID-19 pandemic. As we know, a lot of universities struggles right now with the uh, problems with resources. Uh, we, as the researchers, we are required to become increasingly involved in matters uh, that can be classified as scientific related, which, uh, which does not go hand in hand with both wage increase and changing expectations directly related to the scientific sphere. Of course, now during the pandemic, um, we can feel that it is easier to reach a lot of conferences, a lot of webinars, etc. But at the end of the day, um, our um, day has still only 12 hours uh, and the, the other I do 
see as more the a time of rest. Um, it seems that also the globalization is here an issue uh, because it plays a very important role in the changes taking place in the academic environment. Uh, thanks to globalization, it is much easier uh, to disseminate uh, our results of work all around the world very quickly and also it is connected with uh, my previous statement that it is now much easier uh, to just be a part of the global society. Another important issue is related to combining scientific work with our life passion. Uh, with this uh, arrangement, a researcher is easily tempted to commit his own resources to, de to develop uh, his career, but on the other hand, we do just work constantly. So it is difficult to control us um, on, the, on the level to which employer is entitled. Uh, so controlling the work of researcher can be um, connected with entering into very delicate areas. Um, areas connected with, uh, with our personal, personal life. Why is it so? Um, so the question is, is then the subordination in academia, both from the organize, organizational and financial perspective, only illusory? There is uh, no doubt that uh, subordination in academia, of course, changed throughout the years. Uh, one of the reasons of why it is um, not that easy to control uh, our work right now is, of course, the development of new technologies. Uh, two minutes, uh, two minutes, Isabella, two minutes. Okay, 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 not a problem, which basically makes us work 24-7. Um, and also, um, what, is, um, what is important is that our work can be um, done from every place in the world. Uh, what is also very crucial is that we do work constantly because we work through our head. It means that we basically work through thinking. And first of all, we cannot make anyone stop thinking. On the other hand, unfortunately, we cannot make anyone start thinking. So are we really subordinated when it comes to making a research? Um, we can be, our subordination can be seen from the perspective of, for example, teaching um, obligations. So are we, um, can we be made to teach in particular time? Can we be obliged to teach particular uh, students? Can we be obliged so who to teach, how to teach, where to teach, when to teach. Can we be obliged to make research in a specific area? If, if yes, if the, if the answer to this question is yes, can we be obliged to make this research in a uh, specific manner? Can we be obliged to write papers on the topic and see this topic from the perspective told uh, to us by our employer. Can we be then obliged to do some administrative and reporting activities, which we of course love the most? And here probably the, the answer is yes, but when we see the other question, which I asked from the perspective of, uh, of freedom, I'm just finishing, yes, um, the, the answer is not that easy. So. Here, what I see is the conflict between two values, and it's not conflict between me and Marta. It is just conflict between two values. From the one hand, we have subordination, but from the other hand, we have the freedom of research about which Marta will be um, talking uh, in a minute. So what do we have to do is try to uh, wave the balance between what we as the academics have to do and what we want to do. Okay, so let me uh, put three dots here and pass the screen to Marta. Super, okay. I'm going to ask Marta to... Yes, so I'm here. I'm terribly sorry. Yeah, I, I will try to uh, stay with you as much as I can. Uh, 
just in case, because I'm really terrified now that something is going to be going on with my uh, electricity again. So I will, just in case it happens again, uh, I will switch off the camera so uh, so my mobile will uh, connect me immediately. I think it's safer than just interruption. If Super. and then, if possible, I will just join you with the with the camera. Sorry for that. Um, and I'm not sure necessarily what Isabella m mentioned about the academic freedom, so I hope I could uh, just make a guess, um, since I haven't heard you were about it. Yeah, that's the point. <laughs> okay, perfect. So I have uh, so I have a chance to elaborate on it uh, further on. So my topic is the performance management imperative uh, versus the operational autonomy in academia. For what is academia Europea? So uh, probably uh, the presentation will be the same and will not provide you with a with a ready answer. Rather, it will uh, I will just focus on asking uh, questions that are important to to grasp this very very complex relationship between the tendencies that we observe nowadays in the, uh, in the, at the universities and and on the other hand the, the 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 concept of the autonomy in academia as such. If we look in general uh, in the organizational history of the so-called temple of knowledge or, or the ivory tower, call it as you wish. Uh, it was always full of paradoxes and and some kind of contradictions uh, of the old with the new. Somehow, uh, despite this uh, years uh, like 900 years of existence, uh, we managed somehow to to um, to uh, to develop a relatively stable ethos, an ethos within which knowledge and uh, and the academic freedom were always treated as kind of autotelic values. However, if we look what's going on right now since like the last decades, um, this ethos is really being seriously challenged by, by more and more, uh, I would say, turbulent uh, ecosystem in which the universities uh, operate. So the very concept of the knowledge-based economy and the pressure, uh, the global pressure that it puts on the transfer of specific, relevant, adequate knowledge to the economy uh, makes the universities uh, increasingly judged in terms of uh, the ability to produce human capital as well as to contribute to, uh, to international economic competi competitiveness. Uh, so the scientific knowledge as such uh, is more and more uh, perceived as a market uh, use uh, value, uh, it is, which is very much expressed in a question like, what can I do with this knowledge in practice? Uh, and this tendency, uh, if, you, if you study literature, uh, leads to a certain shift, if it has not already led to a certain shift from liberal to entrepreneurial uh, uh, university as such. And the results and modifications are visible everywhere in the administrative structures, in the legal regulations, uh, which are about the functioning, the missions, and the strategies. So, from the if we look, if we try to look at it, at those transformations from the labor law perspective, probably the most troublesome seems to be the so-called performance management system, uh, which is based on a number of functions and, and processes that, that they are introduced in order to achieve uh, a predetermined organizational objectives through employees' uh, work performance. Uh, so uh, the, the introduction of this system is, uh, was, um, is directly linked to this increase, uh, to this pressure to increase research output, and but also to increase um, the public accountability of universities, as well as the management of public funds. So what we observe is the increased reporting requirements, the the, the increased quantifiable methods for, for universities, uh, as well as strengthening internationalization. So uh, this shift from the uh, towards mechanisms of motivation and verification is indeed transforming uh, the European academic culture into from from the culture of trust and colleg collegiality into a culture of control. Um, so uh, 
at the same time, all this quantitative parametrization, the points and tables and rankings and this uh, fight for the uh, excellence, uh, uh, this rhetoric of performance uh, excellence in academia seems to be really counterintuitive to, to the traditionally conceived operational uh, autonomy uh, of academic work, workforce uh, and most specifically uh, for the academic freedom which is at the heart of this concept of operational uh, autonomy. Uh, as we all know, uh, there is no doubt that academic freedom is central and super important uh, to the functioning of universities nowadays. And its, it's, it's importance uh, is generally underlined uh, in national constitutions, is generally underlined in the uh, uh, Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union. Still, uh, from the legal point of view, it is, it is very much concept that is open to uh, interpretation which uh, which is very problematic uh, when you think about it from the standpoint of uh, providing adequate safeguards. Um, uh, also if you look at the explanations for example just to give you one example uh, to the charter they are very laconic on this point. Um, they, they just barely state that uh, it, is, it is academic freedom is a right that is primarily derived from the, right, uh, from the freedom of thought and expression as such. Uh, when you look at the literature, what is interesting uh, is that basically most of the concepts they seem to be uh, they seem to be based upon the uh, American Association of University Professors statement on principles and academic freedom on tenure from 1940, uh, which emphasizes different dimensions of freedom, uh, academic freedom. So uh, according to this document, uh, it encompasses uh, freedom in research and dissemination, freedom and teaching, as well as uh, intramural and extramural uh, uh, expression uh, as such. Uh, in the United States, uh, this document has, be beyond uh, a kind of conceptual and policy value, it has undeniable legal value. Uh, and this is evidenced by the fact that uh, uh, in most of the uh, states, from what I understood, um, uh, it, it, its essence of the statement, it forms part of the employment contracts at the universities. Uh, two minutes. Is this is okay? not two minutes. Sorry. Two. Minutes? Yes. Is and this okay? is this is not and this is not the case of the of of the European Union where we just have the Magna Carta Universitatum, but it concentrates uh, basically on the collective dimension of the academic freedom. And we have loads of research about the collective dimension of the academic freedom, not that much about about the individual dimension, which again constitutes the core of this concept of operational autonomy uh, uh, in academia. So if we think about the core, we could, uh, we could uh, formulate a kind of thesis that uh, it could be a right to conduct knowledge-oriented research and dissemination with minimum uh, top-down restrictions. So the main purpose of academic individual dimension of academic freedom would be to prevent uh, teachers and researchers from being dismissed because of the content of their lectures or the content of their text uh, research, etc. Of course, so in this sense, the academic freedom is, is the antithesis of the bureaucratic subordination which comes with the performance management system. Uh, at the same time, academic freedom is not an absolute right. Uh, uh, it, but like other freedoms, uh, it can be limited, provided that you pro that you have really solid justifications for for such limitations. So, and what such limitations, uh, paradoxically, uh, may stem from its collective institutional counterpart, which, according to the European University Association, has the financial, employment, educational, and organizational dimension uh, as such. So the, pr from the perspective of the potential limitations to the academic freedom, the most controversial nowadays seems to be uh, the subordination of academic freedom to, to the inter internationally uh, conceived academic standards of quality in teaching and uh, research. So the main question we have to ask ourselves is, is to what extent the value of scientists and university uh, can result 
only from imposed criteria which are very much uh, variable uh, and the essence of which is, uh, is in the end numerical indexing. Uh, at the same time, we have uh, ever-expanding teaching quotas, the ever-increasing uh, formal and administrative burdens, as Isabella mentioned, uh, which make it really difficult for us to fulfill all those duties uh, and again to uh, duties that are not that decisive if you, if you look at the periodic evaluation of, of researcher and the COVID-19 has just added a, a completely new dimension to uh, to this issue so again uh, it seems that this participation in uh, in the top-down imposed struggle for the academic excellence may be perceived from the labor law perspective as a source of sui generis uh, commodification of academic labor. Uh, because in the competition that is provoked by the systems, uh, we are just places in very... Sorry? About 10 the time seconds. is over. It's a 100 meters. Okay. So, okay. Uh, so, uh, so we are just basically uh, uh, treated as places in, in the in various uh, rankings. So uh, we just have to ask, I mean, one of the key questions, and I will leave it, uh, here, I will leave you here with this uh, open question is, to what extent we should accept the the end or the death uh, uh, of, the, of the traditionally conceived academic freedom, or rather, uh, by acknowledging that the academic freedom is not uh, a universal or a historical category, but rather a kind of social construction, uh, we shall, as labor lawyers, try to delineate and effectively uh, protect, facilitate, and strengthen its essence and core. Uh, and that's it. Thank you very much. Super, Martha. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. We're going to go back in the q and I'm sure uh, about this uh, back to you. But uh, now we have to give the floor to David. David Mangan, who is around us, is already shown his slide, and he will be talking not about a PhD about platform, PhD in online platforms. David, I'm very happy to give you the floor if you're ready to do so. Yes, thank you. I hope everyone can hear me. Uh, thank you, Frank and Natalie, for joining us in the panel. Thank you to my uh, uh, colleagues, Marta and Isabella, and thank you, Jacopo, for putting on and his team for putting this on in difficult times. Uh, as I, as uh, Frank mentioned, my topic is looking at IT, but I think there is in academic work. Uh, what though I think is important to understand is that uh, the technology is embedded in uh, a continuum, uh, what I'll call it, and bringing our discussion to uh, a more individual level, I'd suggest that all of us are, as Isabella said, that we're all under employment contracts, but we have this, what I would call implied term of professional expectations. And what I mean by that is that because we are employees, but even though we have a professional standing, uh, there's an expectation as to what our uh, obligations are. And that is, in, as I think a lot of you will agree, an ever expanding uh, spectrum. So no. just skipping ahead here, I think uh, in this references work that uh, Frank was kind enough to mention that Marta and Isabella put together with the precarious workbook that I was happy to be involved in. I, I think we in labor law become a bit preoccupied with uh, uh, what we'll call uh, vulnerable workers. And I don't think that's misplaced, but I think we also ignore what we might look at as creeping vulnerability. And so here, drawing on the work of the American uh, legal scholar, Martha Abertson Feynman, I think what we have here in academia is, um, 
if we look at ourselves as professionals and the idea is, well, we're autonomous and independent, I think that's very much in question right now. We have a vulnerability within this uh, professional expectation, this implied term. Um, and I would say that we're vulnerable in a few ways. Just the last uh, bullet point there. In terms of being employees, there's a subordination uh, despite our professional qualifications so that we're more of an employee as opposed to a professional because all of us must have, I think uh, I'm safe in saying at least three degrees uh, to get to this point. And just to extend this, uh, even though we're looking at the EU, I bring forward this uh, story from Canada and draw your attention to the middle bullet point where a, uh, a contract professor at a university in Canada says, I'm not an anomaly, I'm an increasingly, I am increasingly the new norm. And this vulnerability in academia can be seen in the use of temporary contracts, but I think that's not the only way that we see this, uh, what I would call a denigration of uh, autonomy, uh, particularly the professional autonomy. So looking at the last bullet point here, the breadth of expectations made of professional employees by their employers expands the work members of the cohort are obliged to undertake. Now I have some examples and I'm not going to go through all of them, but I have shared the slides. Uh, one point that I'll draw your attention to is in this case here from the UK, the middle bullet point. These cases look at teachers and teachers have been uh, classified by courts in Canada and the UK are my examples as professional employees. And I'll draw your attention to the middle bullet point where the court says professional identity is inseparable from the nature of the work. And I think this is an important linkage that is being made. And that linkage, I think, comes in the uh, concept of, well, there is this unwritten aspect of our work. And just looking at the bolded portion of this quotation in the second bullet point, a contract for the employment of a professional in a professional capacity would not normally be expected to detail the professional obligations expected of the employee under the employment contract. So we're labor lawyers and we're quite well aware of the contract, but the force of the contract, but what I'm saying is that there's what I would call an implied term of professional expectation that adds an incredible amount and adds uh, quite a bit of leeway to uh, what the expectations are. So that by the time if we, we derive instruction from these points, we see that there's an idealization of the contract. And as I said, the status of being an employee trumps professional designation. So that uh, subordinate, there's subordination and with that comes vulnerability. So if we look at now with information technology, and I think we become a bit preoccupied with the platform or gig economy. And I don't mean that as a criticism. There is a lot to be said there. But uh, focusing on my last bullet point here, the platform economy speaks to larger issues than employment status, for example, that we've often talked about. And I think academia is a good example of that. And I'll just read to you the bolded portion in this uh, slide. And this is from uh, a British journalist who uh, wrote the, this book uh, called WTF question mark, which if you're fluent in English, you understand what he's saying, but I can't repeat it. Uh, but he writes, so in a typical day, along with my television broadcast, I'd 
Expect to write blogs for ITV's website and for my Facebook Live page. I'd record little video essays for Facebook and Twitter. I would do live broadcasts via Facebook and Periscope, and I would put out maybe 20 odd comments to those who follow me on Twitter. My output and productivity has increased enormously, but I work longer hours and those hours are busier than they have ever been. And I put it to the group here. How does this match with academia? Because I think that the intensification of work that Robert Peston is speaking to in his experience, and he started in the 1990s, the intensification of his work as uh, is something that I think academics can point to as well. So I put at the end, are academics uh, supposed to be influencers? So you might have heard of social media influencers. It seems to be an expansion of the role that uh, academics have so that the online academic presence is something that is being looked to. And this, Two minutes, I think David. we have, thank you. I think we have to look at this uh from a critical vantage point when you're online you engage in conversation and commentary but it also opens you up to a, a quite a bit of vitriol quite a bit of negativity and I, I think that's an important dimension that has to be uh stressed so that in this is the last slide when we're talking about subordination, and I know in the last panel there was talk about whether or not subordination should be part of or, or can, should have a dominant place in uh, the employment contract. What I'd say is that we in academia, we have two forms of subordination uh, in the physical and the virtual. Uh, so in the first bullet point here, I talk about the intensification of work, noting that uh, obtaining a full-time permanent position is itself a bit of an Olympic feat. Um, but there's been an enlargement of our professional expectations, and these come through the physical, doing the teaching, administrative service, researching, writing, and I think also the engagement, external engagement, we should note. And then we have this virtual subordination where we're supposed to have a fingerprint or an imprint or whatever the uh, human resource term in fashion is right now uh, online. So my, the question I leave you with is what effect does this have on contemporary academic employment? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you for this. Well, we have a, I'm sure we have a lot of questions, uh, but Natalie, we have asked Natalie to come in and to raise issues and questions and reflect on what has been uh, has been said. Natalie, you, are, you have the floor. And we don't hear you, Natalie. You should. I think you should push a button for the microphone. It's better now. Yes. You can hear me now. Okay. So. Thank you uh, for that, and uh, thank you to the panel for inviting me uh, to the role of discussion. Little did I know uh, what this uh, implied, but um, so uh, thank you for three really, really interesting perspectives and uh, food for thought for avenues uh, from here and forward. Uh, so thanks you for that. Also, I think this topic has an extra level of interest for us as academics, of course, first because it affects us uh, in our, our own work, but also second because we fully understand sort of the overall role of uh, freedom uh, uh, of academic freedom and the and and why it is so important for the overall societal development that we have this uh, freedom of research and maybe even some of us are like uh, driven by that uh, overall purpose. So thank you for that. Um, I think that uh, your three perspectives sort of put in, uh, sort of summing in on some uh, common lines. Uh, of course, we have the sort of employment contract uh, departure for uh, David Mangan that introduces us to a creeping vulnerability, um, a professional expectations. That's an implied term that sort of uh, reaches beyond sort of the, the boundaries of the contract which also increases uh, vulnerability. 
and and uh, this uh, um, uh, increased expectation can blur uh, private time, working time. It can uh, seep into us uh, be expected to have a role in social media, and also to have new skills. Uh, so and uh, so that in itself, I think, strikes a, a vulnerability note. Um, as well as a call for labor law to uh, to assist in uh, going forward for this. Second, uh, or first, we had uh, Isabella's uh, presentation, who who dives into the concept of subordination, and and also uh, to uh, that subordination is not only the direction of the employer to instruct, but but it has moved beyond that. And how do we see subordination here for institutional and economic resources? Uh, and when you link that with a, a passion to work, uh, which is the driver, as well as um, the, the interest of the control, but also the difficulties of the employer to control. Uh, I think you post us with uh, some really good food for thought as well. Um, and and uh, then, of course, Marta, who, uh, who introduces us to operational autonomy, um, the performance management, uh, system versus the academic freedom and this entire layer of excellency and measuring how that sort of uh, undermines or uh, takes away uh, elements of the freedom, like the conceptual freedom of academics. Um, and uh, you are calling for like a legal instrument that uh, further protects the concept of what is academic freedom and um, and uh, also uh, your uh, ending question is, uh, should we keep on um, uh, diving or, or looking towards the ideology of freedom of academia, or should we rather instead try to uh, move freedom of academia into uh, the realm of labor law, where we know so well how to work with, protect, delimit, uh, improve um, the way you work? So, uh, so I think that was an, an, a, a really good uh, question to uh, end with and also to start with. So, uh, and I can just say that even in Denmark, just today, we had, um, the, um, uh, well, last week, the Minister of Research and Education was um, publicly questioning the objectivity of research of researchers that had uh, looked into some uh, politically very hot uh, topics that uh, some, uh, one of the sides of the politicians in Denmark were very critical about uh, are spending public money on research in this area. And the minister sort of went it on, took it on herself to start to criticize the objectivity of these researchers and, and indeed the merits of these researchers. So of course, uh, the university deans and rectors are sort of saying, back off minister, this is not what you're supposed to do. Uh, but uh, so this is a hot topic as we speak also in Denmark. So uh, I was thinking about, uh, so one line of thought I've addressed is sort of the creeping vulnerability in employment positions, the uncertain career prospects, the growing expectations, uh, as well as um, uh, owning uh, your research in a way indirectly by setting up measurements. So there's sort of some sort of sort of uh, vulnerability that is distinct uh, in academia that could uh, one one line of thought to be addressed. Another line of thought was introduced by you, uh, Isabella, was the element of control. Uh, are we subject to formal control before choosing topics, before choosing content for teaching, before choosing topics for, or are we uh, subject to control? after by sanctioning mechanisms, uh, either as disciplinary measures or by funding measures taken away, or uh, indeed by um, politicians uh, criticizing you publicly, the criticism afterwards. A third line of thought is, the, um, so there was two, the third line of thought is the close connection between work in academia and passion. Uh, there is sort of this, because there's all the thoughts out there. You cannot stop thinking. You cannot. There's all the thoughts in the world to be had. And we are here because we like that. So there's this inherent um, problem, I think, or challenge, or but also what we sweetness about uh, working in academia. So how to address that? 
Uh, David, you also addressed it in you say, is it something that you must do? Can you can can that be or is it something that you are allowed to do or, or can it even be said you are not allowed to work anymore? You have to stop working today. So there's that sort of inherent uh, mechanism in academia. And then one thing I would like to ask you all of you is to um, which I did not hear much about yet, but we can think about is the role of external funding. Um, the external funding is uh, provided to the researchers that can that can demonstrate the better narrative, not necessarily the better research question uh, from a, a scientific point of view. Also, uh, external research funding often comes with um, terms for the research. Uh, terms, maybe not so much in, in, in terms of methods, but in terms of topics, as well as terms for dissemination of results after. We've had uh, quite a few scandals on that issue in Denmark uh, over the last two years. Uh, so uh, extern the role of external funding in, in sort of delimiting uh, both the uh, topics that are researched on, but also the, uh, the, the greater value for society of the research that's being conducted. And um, that's it. Yeah, yeah. And uh, my last question is: What's the limit for uh, for outer outer limits for complete autonomy? I think we all know that there must be something that the employer can stop. How do we stop or redirect or harness in the completely crazy professor vendetta? That's not good for anything. Um, that's that's sort of uh, how do we uh, assess when we reach that limit? That's it for now. And mm -hmm. thank you again for all your. Thank you, Natalie. I think uh, a solution could be that we make a research project and everybody who participates in the LLRN will be part of the research project. So we don't <laughs> compete with each other anymore about this. But thank you so much. This is very inspiring indeed, as I saw also on the chat. We had a quite uh, early question already from Manfred, who was sort of, I think, going together, Natalie, with your concern, the last one that you gave. How can we let's say, go back in the other direction in terms of more freedom uh, in the work that we do? And is this a development that we can, uh, let's say, put, put backwards or make uh, to go in another direction? Can um, I, can I, I don't know, Isabella, if you have... Manfred, did you want to, to add something to this? You, you have raised yes, your hand. I would like to... to, to uh... <laughs> let's say, uh, a bit more provocative. You know, okay. what I see is a development, and there I'm in full agreement uh, with you, Natalie, where external funding plays an ever bigger role. Because what I see in particular in this country is that universities are remodeled into a sort of economic entities. And uh, this leads to... Uh, terrible uh, uh, consequences. For example, you know, the reputation of professors in this country, well, is linked to the amount of external funding they succeed to get. And this, of course, is, in my view, the end of real independence. And as far as I can see, I'm a one, a dinosaur here, one of the last generation of independence. We didn't have these kind of things. I feel very sorry for you young people. And my question is, as as uh, Frank already said, is it possible to take this back, to return this, and to come back to a situation where we can get rid of this dependence of external funding? I doubt it very much from what I see. Uh, I don't know, Isabella, if you have views on this, I want yes, to... yes, yes. I, I, yeah, I, I would, I would like to give the comment to what uh, Professor Weiss said. So I think that whenever the money are involved, that there is uh, no place for freedom and no place for uh, feel independent because the money are what stick us somewhere. And when it comes to money for research, of course, it is a great issue. And I'm pretty sure we cannot go back but we can think of where we want to go forward, where we want to move. 
because it's always not bad, not, not good to just uh, go back to the history because the history was involved in other also economic situations and so on and so on. So what we have to do and what we should do and what, why why we also wanted this topic to write, it was the idea where where should we go? Like what where should we what, what should we do now? Because of course we can always do more. We can always work more. I love my job and I am workaholic and everyone knows that. And sometimes it is just hard to stop me from working. But then the question is whether there should be some boundaries for people like me or there should be boundaries for people who uh, who are just doing their regular uh, regular activities and where those boundaries should be when it comes to the subordination so to my topic and when it comes to uh, more what Marta was uh, talking about and probably she will just um, tell, tell more about it um, how 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 far should we go into escalating the points and the number of publications, citations, and so on and so on. There is always another conference to go. There is always another journal to write to. There is always another project to apply for. So, but there have to be boundaries because uh, at the end of the day, we are still only humans. Marta, of course, you, you can interfere. But I think we also have two additional questions that are related to what you have said about academic freedom. So you may also want to, to take that step to respond to Beryl's question about how to deal with the passion about which uh, Isabella just has been talking and um, how to get this, let's say, in an academic freedom context more in the, in the direction of a right that may protect us. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I will try to combine, in fact, all the questions. So I, I would like to start from the question you asked, uh, Frank, uh, because I think it's crucial to to uh, to our understanding of a potential starting point for labor law uh, perspective on this dimension. So we do have to understand uh, that this academic freedom, in theory at least, it has both individual uh, value dimension and collective institutional dimensions. So institutional di dimensions represented by the university. University that is community of researchers and that is supposed to protect us and to protect also the uh, emodicum of academic freedom, the essence, the core of academic freedom that is there at the university. Um, so this, this collective and the individual dimensions of ag academic freedom, they are not mutually exclusive, quite the opposite. They should reinforce each other. The problem is that with the growing pressure from the government that comes on the, uh, on the universities, they are changing the narrative. And they, uh, with many, uh, upon many different dimensions, the organizational one, the, the, the one related to employment, also teaching, uh, as well as financial, model, the, the crucial ones. Uh, I mean, when you have, in a, in, a, in a typical scenario, when you have a conflict of rights, in theory, everything, how, how to make a, a freedom be protected, everything is about strong balancing. And then we have to ask ourselves, what does it mean a strong balancing uh, under from the labor law perspective? And who should be the actors responsible for uh, bringing back this uh, um, balance between the collective and the individual dimension of academic freedom? I mean, the typical response would be, let's try with the judges at first, but still we have to bring a case first. I I'm not aware of any case being brought because of this uh, change from uh, from the Humboldt idea of the university to its more entrepreneurial university. So also the question is whether or not this is something, this new organizational culture that is developing in front of our eyes. Is it is it truly something that we want to fight with? Uh, or is it something that we've already accepted it? I'm, I mean, I'm not of the labor uh, lawyers, labor law lawyers, uh, or labor law academics. Uh, but I think we should. Uh, I mean, the the um, the chance that we will uh, cha change something is uh, is very much dependent upon the expectations of the academia as such. And this is something uh, that's 
uh, I think we can find, uh, um, you know, um, we can find people who who think uh, that the entrepreneur uh, shift is is the right one because it brings us towards more meritocracy because you have points and it's more objective than just you know a college collegiate uh, university that was, you know, every now and then discriminatory, etc. So I think it's everything is about a starting point. We have to understand what is the starting point, and then the next step is about strong balancing. Like where do we want to uh, end up in the end? You know? Thank you. Well, if if I may, because I was looking and and Janice has raised the question for David. I also had a question for David in mind. We, we still have about two two and a half minutes to go for David and. Um, I was wondering, uh, David, if you could, I know you have a philosophical mind, but I have the impression that in this whole story, um, freedom, and we also look at COVID-19 as a new period, but freedom is not taken for granted anymore. And so the whole thing of justifying what we have been doing over the past years and to, to get impact in academia and to give output to academia offline and online is part of this very bigger sort of move of of questioning freedom and what you do with our freedom. But I'm going to Janice's question on, would you discuss more the reasonable professional expectations for an academic? David, I think you can read from the chat box what is there, whether that does not infringe on autonomy. And then to her thinking that this main trend is the focus on quantity versus quality. David? Thank you, Frank. Uh, just Picking up, uh, before I answer uh, Janice's question, picking up on Marta and Isabella's point, uh, uh, drawing some of the earlier questions together, uh, I think, uh, you know, the term passion, my response is, how can you monetize passion for academics, make them uh, apply for funding, uh, and tell them their jobs depend upon it? So I think universities will say, uh, well, it's not us, it's the state. They have cut back on how much money they give us, so we're having to find money elsewhere. Uh, uh, and I'll note that uh, a few of us are still waiting for uh, the EU funding uh, award or uh, information about an application we made in July. And so, you know, I know there's COVID and so on, but the lethargic pace of uh, getting these funding projects through, I think, is a, a another factor that we maybe want to keep in mind. Janice's question, the reasonable professional expectations that don't infringe upon autonomy. I, you know, I, I think I'm, I spent more of my time in the UK and in the UK, I found there was a lot of curbing of autonomy. For example, I was told, uh, don't write in labor law, uh, write in information technology. And that's not why I do it, uh, why I write information technology. That comes from when I practice. Um, so I'm not sure what the reasonable professional expectations are that don't infringe upon autonomy. Um, because I, I I guess it's more that's more a statement on I know it when I see it and I have yet to see it. Uh, so it's a hard question in the abstract to answer, but I think certainly one of the points is the research freedom. And, and I think part of the boldness of our project, Marta, Isabella and I here is I don't think uh, some universities would be very happy with this project. And I think this project in itself is a statement on uh, pushing back on that autonomy uh, to say, well, you know, if you're going to assess our work, we're going to assess from the employment perspective how universities are conducting themselves. And I think that is a fair uh, statement to make. Well, I'm looking at the timing. David and colleagues, and I think we uh, will have about to, to stop. But just for those who, uh, who do not know what WTF means, it means we tolerate Frank. It may also be we thank Frank, whatever you want to fill in. But of course, we thank the panel for this 
very inspiring discussion and we see each other back online and we have a break so thank you so much to all of you thanks so much